Chapter Three of Windsor Castle, Book Four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Windsor Castle, Book Four, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Chapter Three: How Mabel Lindwood was taken to the castle by Nicholas Clamp and how they encountered Morgan Fenwolf by the way. The storm which had fallen so heavily on the castle had likewise visited the lake, and alarmed the inmates of the little dwelling on its banks. Both the forester and his granddaughter were roused from their beds, and they sat together in the chief apartment of the cottage, listening to the awful rolling of the thunder, and watching the blue flashing of the lightning. The storm was of an unusually long duration, and continued for more than an hour with unintermitted violence it then paused the thunder rolled off and the flashes of lightning grew fainter and less frequent during the storm mabel continued on her knees addressing the most earnest prayers to the virgin for her preservation and that of her grandfather but the old forester though evidently much alarmed uttered not a single supplication but remained sitting in his chair with a sullen scared look as the thunder died away, he recovered his composure, and addressed himself to soothe the fears of his granddaughter. In this he had partially succeeded, and was urging her again to seek her couch, when the storm recommenced with fresh fury. Mabel once more fell to her knees, and the old man resumed his sullen posture. Another dreadful half-hour, marked by a succession of terrible peals and vivid flashes, succeeded when, amidst an awful pause, mabel ventured to address her old relative why do you not pray grandfather she said regarding him uneasily sister anastasia and good father anselm always taught me to utter an ave and cross myself during a thunderstorm why do you not pray grandfather do not trouble me i have no fear but your cheeks and lips are blanched rejoined mabel and i observed you shudder during that last awful crash pray grandfather pray peace wench and mind your own business returned the old man angrily the storm will soon be over it cannot last long in this way the saints preserve us cried mabel as a tremendous concussion was heard overhead followed by a strong sulphurous smell the cottage is struck it is it is cried tristram springing to his feet and rushing forth for a few minutes mabel continued in a state of stupefaction then she staggered to the door and beheld her grandfather occupied with two dark figures whom she recognized as valentine hagthorpe and morgan fenwolf in extinguishing the flames which were bursting from the thatched roof of the hut surprise and terror held her silent and the others were so busily engaged that they did not notice her at last by their united effort the fire was got under without material damage to the little building and mabel retired expecting her grandsire to return but as he did not do so and as almost instantly afterwards a plash of oars was heard on the lake she flew to the window and beheld him by the gleam of the lightning seated in the skiff with morgan fenwolf one valentine hagthorne had mounted a black horse and was galloping swiftly away mabel saw no more overcome by fright she sank on the ground insensible when she recovered the storm had entirely passed a heavy shower had fallen but the sky was now perfectly clear and day had begun to dawn mabel went to the door of the hut and looked forth for her grandfather but he was nowhere to be seen she remained gazing at the now peaceful lake until the sun had fairly risen when feeling more composed she retired to rest and sleep which had been banished from them during the greater part of the night now fell upon her lovely eyelids when she awoke the day was far advanced but still old tristram had not returned and with a heavy heart she set about her household concerns the thought however of her anticipated visit to the castle speedily dispelled her anxiety and she began to make preparations for setting out attiring herself with unusual care Bouchier had not experienced much difficulty in persuading her to obey the king's behest, 
and by his artful representations he had likewise induced her grandfather to give his consent to the visit the old forester only stipulating that she should be escorted there and back by a falconer named nicholas clamp in whom he could put trust to which proposition bouchier readily assented at length five o'clock the appointed hour arrived and with it came nicholas clamp he was a tall middle-aged man with yellow hair clipped closely over his brows and a beard and moustaches to match his attire resembled that of a keeper of the forest and consisted of a doublet and hose of green cloth but he did not carry a bugle or hunting knife his sole weapon was a stout quarter-staff after some little hesitation mabel consented to accompany the falconer and they set forth together the evening was delightful and their way through the woods was marked by numberless points of beauty mabel said little for her thoughts were running upon her grandfather and upon his prolonged and mysterious absence but the falconer talked of the damage done by the thunderstorm which he declared was the most awful he had ever witnessed and he pointed out to her several trees struck by lightning Proceeding in this way, they gained a road leading from Blackness, when, from behind a large oak, the trunk of which had concealed him from view, Morgan Fenwolf started forth, and planted himself in their path. The gear of the prescribed keeper was wild and ragged, his locks matted and disordered, his demeanour savage, and his whole appearance forbidding and alarming. I have been waiting for you for some time, Mabel Linwood, he said. You must go with me to your grandfather. My grandfather would never send you for me, replied Mabel, but if he did, I will not trust myself with you. The saints preserve us, cried Nicholas Clamp. Can I believe my eyes? Do I behold Morgan Fenwolf? Come with me, Mabel, cried Fenwolf, disregarding him. But she returned a peremptory refusal. She shall not stir an inch, cried the falconer. It is thou, Morgan Fenwolf, who must go with me. Thou art a prescribed felon, and thy life is forfeit to the king. Yield thee, dog, as my prisoner. The prisoner, echoed Fenwolf scornfully. It would take three such as thou art to make me captive. Mabel Linwood, in your grandfather's name, I command you to come with me, and let Nick Clamp look to himself if he dares to hinder you. Nick will do something more than hinder her, rejoined the falconer, brandishing his staff and rushing upon the other. Felon hound, I command thee to yield. Before the falconer could reach him, Morgan Fenwolf plucked a long hunting knife from his girdle and made a desperate stab at his assailant. But Clamp avoided the blow and striking Fenwolf on the shins immediately afterwards closed with him. The result was still doubtful when the struggle was suddenly interrupted by the trampling of horse approaching from the side of windsor and at the sound morgan fenwolf disengaged himself from his antagonist and plunged into the adjoining wood the next moment captain bouchier rode up followed by a small band of halberdiers and receiving information from the falconer of what had occurred darted with his men into the wood in search of the fugitive Nicholas Clamp and his companion did not await the issue of the search, but proceeded on their way. As they walked at a brisk pace, they reached the long avenue in about half an hour and took their way down it. When within a mile of the castle, they were overtaken by Bouchier and his followers, and the falconer was much disappointed to learn that they had failed in tracking Morgan Fenwolf to his lair. After addressing a few complimentary words to the maiden, Bouchier rode on soon after this the pair quitted the great park and passing through a row of straggling houses divided by gardens and closes which skirted the foot of castle hill presently reached the lower gate they were admitted without difficulty but just as they entered the lower ward the falconer was hailed by shoreditch and paddington who at the moment issued from the doorway of the guard-room clamp obeyed the call and went towards them and it was evident from the gestures of the archers that they were making inquiries about Mabel, whose appearance seemed to interest them greatly. After a brief conversation with the falconer, they approached her, and respectfully addressing her, begged leave to attend her to the royal lodgings, whither they understood she was going. No objection being made to the proposal by Mabel, 
the party directed their course towards the middle ward passing through the gateway of the norman tower they stopped before a low portal in a picturesque gothic wing of the castle with projecting walls and bay windows which had been erected in the preceding reign of henry the seventh and was consequently still in all its freshness and beauty End of chapter three